And welcome back to the Regina 120. Uh, I am Jeff Cliff, and this is a series of 120 videos of things I learned at, as a student at the University of Regina. And today we're going to be talking about the logical fallacy of appeal to emotion, or argument from emotion. Uh, so this is going to be a big subject, uh, and I can't possibly do this entire subject justice in one video. Uh, so this could be a little bit long, and I'm missing stuff. No question about it. Uh, everything I say can probably lead to another video. Uh, but just just getting that out of the way, uh, what what is the appeal to emotion? It, it is basically, as uh, other logical fallacies go, a, a use of uh, emotion rather than evidence or reason uh, or facts or information to conclude a statement or an argument. So something like you know, an emotion is, is, is created uh, or uh, language is used to, to invoke an emotional state and then therefore some P or, or something is true something is false. Uh, notice that this isn't even, this is very close to the argument from ignorance and other uh, such fallacies where you're basically pulling a conclusion out of your hat uh, and unfortunately uh, this actually tends to work. Um, and there are, are places that are appropriate uh, to use emotion and emotionally charged uh, language other other such things or ways of, of getting the emotions going. Music, plays, movies, uh, video, art in almost if not all of its forms. Uh, you can even use these things to make political or or statements relating to the to, to making the statements that are true or false. Uh, the problem is is that emotion can be used to argue for practically any conclusion. Uh, just kind of using an example from this week, uh, the uh, white nationalist Daily Stormer uses pride or tries to invoke feelings of pride and heroism to argue against their perceived, you know, big enemy, the Jewish influence or whatever it is. Um, and so th th this is just sort of a, a one example of, you know, an extreme uh, case where yes, you can use it to argue for things that you agree with. But this is pr hopefully something that you probably don't agree with, and yet the, um, the argument is the same. It uses the same kinds of appeals. It uses the same kinds of language, the same uh, visual representations that you might expect from other types of art, or uh, from other people. And yet, they're able to pull it off because, again, when you're not tying your uh, emotional state to information, uh, you get some pretty weird conclusions coming out of it. But they're not the only ones who do this. Um, the, um, uh, the Zionist Hasbara, uh, to take a, a, an example from the complete opposite side of the spectrum, are, are well known for using emotion to control the narratives that they try to control and to use talking points to try to focus people to certain uh, ends and certain uh, kinds of situations that they have to defend themselves, etc. Uh, but again, they're not the only ones either. Uh, Palestinians certainly appeal to emotion when they uh, make political statements. Uh, they, they specifically use timing to make it so that there's uh, sentimental appeals that happen when, the, for example, the European Union does certain things, or, or when the uh, U.S. Uh, is in a certain stage of, you know, media um, uh, attention. Uh, you know, it's 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 all very well coordinated in some cases. Uh, and it's coordinated because appeals to emotions work. Uh, and sometimes that's the only way you can get people to, to kind of back your cause is by appealing to their emotions and appealing to their sense of pity uh, and appealing to their, their, their conscience. And again, they're, they're not the only ones who do this either. Uh, news outlets, uh, the same ones that would cover th these, these appeals, uh, from BuzzFeed to VDARE to the Huffington Post to Fox News, all do this. They do it to drive engagement, to make their readers and their watchers pay attention, to to increase their click throat, uh, click through to advertising or advertisers uh, in general. Th this is not something that is uncommon. It, it happens all the time, 
If you pay attention enough, you'll find it. And, of course, whether or not an advertisement uh, gets my clicks uh, should in no way, shape, or form uh, depend on uh, whether or not I'm happy or sad. Uh, and yet, that's exactly what they try to do. Uh, so, uh, again, and, and, and because it's not tied to uh, any state of information or anything that I could do, uh, it, it can be used against you know, me as the viewer, the listener, the watcher. Uh, it can be used to try to, to pull money from me or to, to it make a, a power relation different. Uh, it can be used to drive political policy. Um, again, without reference or context to whether or not it's a good idea for that, that direction to be changed or for that policy to, to be in, enacted. And so uh, there's always the temptation that if we uh, feel strong emotions, we, we have to do something. Or, or it's more likely that we're going to do something that if we weren't feeling strong emotions. This is a logical fallacy too, and we're going to talk about that in a future video. Uh, but it, again, it, this is something that kind of comes up. And practically everyone is impacted. Uh, the only people who are really not affected by this are sociopaths, which is very unfortunate. Um, according to a researcher, uh, Drew Weston, uh, a, a psychology prof, uh, we're more likely to accept an emotional argument than uh, an argument with actual facts and a uh, rational basis. If, if, if you are given uh, two arguments, one, you know, an argument that's actually well thought through, that the evidence is presented, uh, there's no logical fallacies in it, and you're given an emotionally charged argument, most people will pick the latter, uh, which is, again, very unfortunate, but it's something to be aware of. Uh, there's a, another quote that I found when kind of looking up stuff for this video, which is definitely worth keeping in mind, uh, from the boomerang, uh, quote, effective marketing appeals to reason, or ap appeals to, uh, yeah, it appeals to reason instead of emotion. But again, marketing ap appeals to emotion. That, that's, that's what they do. So um, you're, you're, you're appealing to emotion and it's gonna drive click-throughs. This is what marketing, at, at least often enough, uh, ends up doing. And it can be more effective, and you can be affected by it, and worse yet, you can not know you're affected by it. The levels of emotional states that human beings are capable of, of are often so, uh, that there's such a huge range that there, there's, a, enough dis or th there's enough of them that you can actually trigger some emotions in people, and again, they'll not be aware that they're, they're being emotional, or that their emotions have been triggered, they'll make conclusions, they'll, they'll act, They'll, they'll be guided by their emotion without even knowing that they're being guided. So this makes it hard to correct against because even if you're aware that this is a problem, even if you take steps and you, you know, remind yourself, okay, I'm going to uh, try to, to make you know, a decision on some uh, important topic without my emotions clogging up my vision, and then you end up getting emotionally charged up and you make a decision based on your emotions anyway, again, without knowing it. It's a, it's a danger, it happens and people use this and exploit you with it. Um, and so here, here's an example of, of how your emotions can mislead you in this kind of very subtle way. Uh, there was an experiment done in British Columbia uh, where there's a, apparently there's really famous bridge. It's, a, it's a, uh, uh, a walking bridge over kind of like a really uh, high, narrow pass or something like that where you can look down from this bridge and see quite far down. If you've ever been in the mountains in British Columbia, you'll, you'll kind of know the, the, the danger or the visible sense of danger that you can get by looking down in a very steep cliff or a very deep gorge or something like that. And that apparently this bridge goes over top of it. And the experiment went as follows, where they put a beautiful woman on this bridge uh, and right in the middle. And th they, the, the, the beautiful woman would ask uh, men as they passed by uh, a series of questions. And then at the end of the, the bridge, uh, they would basically ask, try to determine if the, the men uh, had a kind of an emotional attachment to this beautiful woman. And uh, what they were able to, to, to basically prove with this uh, is the same woman in multiple different contexts. Uh, so so they, they could get kind of like a, a blind test of this, uh, is that you can actually be convinced that you're in love and that you can be convinced that you care about someone purely based on your level of arousal 
uh, due to other um, uh, other reasons. So, for example, again, if your if your body is reacting because you're afraid of falling, and you're 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 kind of tensing up and stressed out in a good way, uh, because again, you're you're surrounded by this cliff or or you're you know, suspended in midair, so your body is kind of freaking out a little bit. You know, your conscious mind is aware that this is okay because you're on a bridge that isn't falling down. But again, your your emotional state is triggered, and so your 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 when, when you're faced with the situation, you know, and you're, uh, you're asked about, you know, do you care about this person, you know, you're, you're going to say yes. You're, you're, you're misattributing your emotions to the wrong cause. Again, this, is, this happens all the time. And people can and have used this against you to convince you of things that you wouldn't necessarily otherwise agree on. And so if you can uh, fall prey to this, then certainly judges, attorneys, psychologists, courts, uh, your friends, colleagues, family members, authority figures of all kinds, uh, and people you trust all are impacted by this. They're all affected by this. Uh, even when you take steps against it, chances are you're still going to fall for it once in a while. Um, again, because you don't always know that it's happening. Most of us don't have ECGs and other equipment hooked up to us at all times to monitor our emotional state. This is just something that we haven't lived with long enough and the tools aren't widespread enough to really do. Um, so again, you, it, you, it's hard to, to, to remove this, this, this tendency to, to fall for it uh, in a, a consistent way. What are some examples of this? Uh, well, sex appeal is a good one. Um, it's similar to the, as we discussed in the previous video, the argument from prestige in that there's the kind of implicit uh, hope that you're going to get some. Uh, but again, it's, it's, it's always or, or very often used in, in a way to throw you off balance and to make you think about the sex appeal uh, and to kind of simulate the, the possibility that it may involve you even if it has nothing really to do with that. You know, diet pills, uh, exercise regimes, uh, fitness products of all kinds often try to bring up the, the emotions involved just to get you, again, off tilt uh, to, to be vulnerable uh, so that you can buy into their bullshit. Um, the, it, it, it's worth kind of splitting up what exactly is entailed by emotion. So uh, there's either going to be positive or negative emotions. So you can be you know, happy or sad or, or feeling good in a way or not good or bad in a way. Uh, it could be related to the level of arousal so that you could have a very strong, you know, passionate pride, uh, or you could have a very, you know, subtle, weak calmness, uh, and practically everything in between. The the, the kind or the, the affect, the, the the kind of direction of emotion, you know, the, the difference between say disgust and hap you know, just a, a, a sublime happiness. All all of these are going to be different things that you're going to be able to manipulate. Different things other people are going to try to manipulate in you, uh, and. All of them have different kinds of consequences that can be enumerated and listed. I'm not going to go through the whole list, but I'm going to bring up, again, some examples. Language, uh, all languages are tied uh, based on culture and based on our past experience and based on just the, the structure of language itself to many emotional states. You can manipulate emotion based on your use of language. Uh, and so it's, it's worth uh, you know, going through, trying to make lists perhaps of what words and what phrases are associated with what uh, emotional state. You know, if you can go into the, your machine learning or whatever, figure that stuff out. Again, this isn't something people do all the time. So again, you'll probably be uh, subject to it if people use uh, uh, the right kind of language in a subtle enough way that you don't see it. Um, even the rhythm or the, the prosody or the, 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 the basic structure of how you speak, uh, the rhetoric and politicians ha have uh, for you know, many, many uh, generations used how they speak as a way of manipulating both individuals and groups of people into emo or emotional states. Um, there's a lot of it has to do with anticipation and the building of expectation. Uh, and there's a really good book on this called Sweet Anticipation, uh, which I encourage you to go look up. It's, it's mostly about music, but it can act absolutely uh, apply to practically anywhere where emotion is involved. Um, the, the psychology of emotion in general is a fairly well-developed science. There's still a lot left to learn, uh, but there's a lot we do know about it and how to build it, how to 
use it, and again, uh, how people use it against you. One of the, the risks of using emotional reasoning uh, is that sometimes uh, it only works on part of your audience. Because the information or, or the, the conclusion that your audience is supposed to draw is, again, tied to whether or not they resonate with the particular emotion you're trying to create in them, sometimes only part of your audience is going to be uh, accept your argument or your information. Unfortunately, this means you're probably creating uh, in your audience kind of a, a, a split between different subsets or different parts of your audience. And your, your audience may disagree with each other after the fact as far as whether or not you made a decent point. You know, companies hire musicians and artists and people who are skilled with emotion to try to, again, get their community and their users to engage more with it. Uh, sometimes in ways that it actually don't have anything to do with whether or not they have a good product. Uh, you should always be wary of whether a, or when an ar a company comes up to you or, or has access to the, these musicians and artists because, because again, they can obviously afford to be spending this money which could be used to make their product better, similar to advertising. There's a guy by the name of Edward Bernays uh, who did a lot of research into uh, public relations in the early part of the 20th century. Uh, and he used emotions on large groups of people. Uh, so this is this is this appeal to emotion is not just something in general. It, it can be used not just for you know this abstract uh, you know, dealing with arguments and information in general, uh, but in practice, if you have a large group of people, perhaps a nation state, or everyone on the internet, or everyone who goes to your website, or everyone who's part of your community, chances are, as a group, your emotions can be used. Can be sent or can can be created, can be manipulated, and can be used to do things. Uh, companies like Coca-Cola will, will will intentionally manipulate large groups of people's emotional states so that they can move their product. The uh, NSA, the National Security Agency, uh, kind of among other things, takes kind of an opposite approach, where they'll target specific individuals and kind of appeal to their emotions in certain ways. And so there, there's this range from appealing to emotion for gr large groups to all the way to single individuals and everything in between. There's a lot of ways that our emotional states can mi mislead us uh, when we try to reason with them. Uh, there's the first way is that uh, it's hard to, to get a scope of large numbers of, of things. And large, you know, there are, our minds are only capable of really appreciating things that we can kind of count uh, maybe on our fingers, maybe we can directly experience. Uh, so, for example, automobiles kill hundreds of thousands of people every year. Um, yet, you have one airplane hit one tower in New York, you know, or two towers in New York once. And what do people flip out about more? Generally, they flip out about the latter because it's something that's visual. It's something that you can you can remember that happened, that you can kind of always keep in mind. Um, there's millions of, of, of refugees in danger at this very moment, but it's hard to really wrap your mind around them. And yet, you have one line in, you know, somewhere in Africa being shot. It's again one example that's very easy to wrap your mind around. So your emotions can be engaged with that. If we had every single uh, automobile accident tied to our emotional state, we would be a, an emotional mess. Our brains are just not capable of handling that much tragedy. And yet, this is something that is out there in the world, and it's something that we can reason about. Uh, another way that our, our emotional state can mislead us is that uh, there is a, a lot of hardware in our brains that's uh, capable of, of dealing with, with situations based on emotional states. But those situations tend to be simple things. Simple things like running away from danger, or noticing that a bad man is doing something bad and must be stopped. These are the sorts of things that we, we have evolved to deal with, but there's only so many of these kind of situations, and they're very simple, and it's very easy to, to miss the nuance in the situation, uh, and miss potential consequences that are not really uh, relevant on an evolutionary time scale. So, for example, if, if we just, you know, quote, stop the bad man, uh, we risk, you know, by doing so, locking up and maybe throwing him away, but also changing case law in the common law system to imprison innocent people using the same reasoning we imprisoned him with. 
which, again, is not necessarily a big deal, until we realize that by imprisoning innocent people, part of the people that we're imprisoning are scientists and really smart people that we're now locking away in cages, and that our collective ability to solve problems is reduced because the people who have the information necessary to solve them are now in cages and unable to solve problems. Slogans work on this principle. Uh, simple simple uh, statements that are tied to emotional states uh, that are, are, are they're kind of like a, a double uh, punch in this sense because it takes mental work to tear them apart uh, but again the, the amount of work is, is disproportionate to the amount of work it uh, takes to, to store them so the, the, the Occam's razor kind of works to our disadvantage in those situations uh, poetic language same thing uh, poetry can invoke all sorts of emotions but again can be used to uh, argue for a variety of different things some of which are valid, some of which are not. We can appeal to the feelings of comfort or the desire for com comfort and the feeling of safety. If I were wearing a sweater vest right now, it would make no difference whatsoever on whether or not we should uh, increase or decrease the national income tax in Canada. And yet, this is something that has actually been used by the leadership in this country, uh, which has consequences on what our national tax rate is. Um, again, there, there really is no connection between sweater vest and taxes, and yet sweater vests, again, have been used for just that purpose. The appeal to fear is a big one. Uh, terrorism is, is like the, the, the bread and butter issue for uh, neoconservatism and for a lot of different political uh, viewpoints uh, that wish to have their views uh, adopted as mainstream and their uh, goals uh, accomplished. Uh, there's a good quote about this uh, from uh, Goring in the, at the conclusion of the Second World War. Quote, naturally the people don't want war, neither in Russia nor in England, nor for that matter in Germany. That is understood. But after all, it is the leaders of the country who determine the policy and it is always a simple matter to drag the people along, whether it is a democracy, a fascist dictatorship, or a parliament, or a, communi or a communist dictatorship. Voice or no voice, the people can always be brought to the bidding of leaders. It is easy. All you have to do is tell them that they are being attacked and denounce the peacemakers or peacemakers for uh, lack of patriotism and exposing the country to danger. It works the same in any country. Unquote. It's absolutely true. Terrorism and the threat of terrorism has been used practically across the board, especially since the beginning of the 21st century, um, to to create laws, to restrict people from doing all sorts of things, and to paint political point or political opponents on all sides of the political spectrum in all countries of the world uh, as as dangerous. It works. Many people fall for it. And unfortunately, the, the fear uh, does not necessarily lead to being safer. Uh, there's a lot of, uh, we can go very deep into that, uh, but it's, it's worth checking out the, the links uh, in, in that particular case. And worse, appeals to fear can backfire. So that if there is actually a danger, if you hypersaturate the, the world and the, 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 the political world and the media world with exposure to uh, hearing about fear and hearing about terrible things, people start to, to start to get desensitized to it. Um, an example of where this has backfired probably the most is the Winners Don't Do Drugs campaign in the 80s, where it used to be kind of shoved down uh, children's throats uh, that you know all drugs are bad and that you know nobody who's cool does drugs and you know if you try smoking pot once you're going to get hooked and all sorts of bad things will happen to you. And the problem with that is if you get access to some you know, marijuana or some soft drugs and you experiment with it and then find that they are harmless, it's tempting to go on and try more addictive things and more dangerous things afterwards if you're only exposed to that particular kind of campaign. So the, 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 the lack of information guiding your uh, particular message can backfire in the sense that people stop believing you. This can apply to practically everywhere that fear is used as the entire argument for something to, to be justified. An appeal to spite is another example where it's, it's, it's really easy to, to look at someone who's a, a bad person or a bad, uh, someone who's easy to hate, and then to use them as an example to, to, to make policy or to, 
to make decisions based on their, their particular case. The ACLU and the Canadian Civil Liberties Association here uh, all have to deal with this constantly, where the examples they have to defend uh, somehow have to be tied to the greater good uh, in order for them to, to keep the rest of us kind of off the hook. Um, there's a lot of subreddits being banned right now that are really hard to defend, uh, and yet the uh, censorship is spreading on that particular medium. Uh, another uh, way our emotions can be uh, messed with is by uh, appeals to optimism. Uh, you know, if you believe that nothing bad will happen and everything will be fine, I mean, there, there's a lot of tragedy that happens. A lot of people are suffering all the time. There are problems in the world. There are problems in people's lives. Uh, life is, is a series of, of different uh, occasions that we get to suffer through. Uh, but this doesn't mean we have to you know, obsess about it all the time. But it, similarly, it doesn't mean we have to ignore it. Uh, and so there's just appealing to optimism and just always being optimism sometimes means that you miss opportunities to actually remove the suffering involved. Uh, we have to actually keep our eye out, otherwise we'll miss those opportunities. Uh, the appeals to confidence. Uh, this past uh, couple months, uh, the progressive conservatives in Alberta just got roasted because they weren't confident in uh, enough to lie directly to the Albertan public and to tell them, to some extent, why the e economy wasn't going well. Um, and so the, their lack of ability to project confidence was part of the reason that they, they fell from power. This is a, uh, common enough, uh, in, especially in large institutions and really you know, centers of power, that if the person in charge is not confident, they'll be replaced by someone who is confident. Uh, and they always have to be projecting this kind of confidence in order to uh, you know, at least hope uh, or, or, or sell the hope that the, uh, the institution is valid. Unfortunately, the institution is not always valid. The institution is not always doing well. And sometimes you can get really caught off guard if nobody tells the truth. And if everyone is just a yes man around the, you know, the, the particular people involved, uh, you, can, you can wind up in a huge amount of trouble. Uh, banks have collapsed. Large businesses have collapsed. Uh, here in Canada, we had Know, RIM fell from power, Nortel fell, fell from power. All, a lot of this had to do with not acknowledging problems and projecting an unjustifiable uh, confidence when confidence was not warranted. Quite possibly the best, uh, the easiest to see example of this is whenever you see someone actually come out and say, think of the children. Pretty much any time someone says that, you can usually ignore them after that because Nine times out of ten, it's just an appeal to emotion. Of course, we should uh, be concerned with the status of children, but it's very, very treacherous. Uh, it's very easy to be misled and to have your emotions take control when children are involved. Same thing with cute animals. Telus, the company, the telephone company here in North America, they do this a lot. You know, their commercials are nothing but like cute koala bears and cute pandas. They're a computer company. They sell handheld computers. What do koala bears have to do with a handheld computer? You know, what do cute little animals from the you know, jungle have anything to do with this? Nothing. If you want to see what these animals actually have to do with uh, these little handheld computers, go watch something like All Watched Over by Machines of Loving Grace, the third part. You know, Go track where your, the materials come from to make the components of your electronic materials. Go track down the supply chain in places like the Congo or Zimbabwe, where animals are, are not having a good time right now when being faced with competition because they just happen to be living over you know, Col Coltrane or whatever the, the precious material is. Appeals to flattery. You know, it's, it's said that flattery will get you everywhere. It's mostly true. If you try to appeal to someone's sense of ego to make them feel good about themselves, Oftentimes, they'll let you do something that they wouldn't normally let you do otherwise if you're subtle enough at it. Again, this is not necessarily a good thing. It's, it's just something that works, and it unfortunately works. You can watch out for it, uh, you can detect it, but again, just be aware that this is something that's possible. It's worth uh, pointing out that you should be very careful uh, when you're accusing others of arguing from emotion. 
especially if you're a man and you're talking to a woman. Uh, this is becoming more common in, in modern, or perhaps this year, than any other year I've seen it. Uh, but it's worth looking into, and I couldn't find the statistics when researching for this video, but there is some statistic that you could probably find or do research on it and, and, and do the, the, the study to find out, to actually find out how many times men interpret women as arguing or, or reasoning from emotion versus how many times they actually do in a con and with men being involved. And I would guess that it's more likely that uh, it's over 100%, i.e. that men by default think that women reason from emotion, even though they are not in fact doing so. Guilt tripping is another appeal to emotion, where you're, you're appealing, trying to make someone feel bad about themselves. It's kind of the opposite of flattery, where you're, you're trying to make them the, the kind of decrease their ego or make them look or, or feel bad so that they'll do what you say. A lot of the, the, the basis for our appeal to emotion, or a lot of the basis for acting on emotion, is that when you feel a certain way, your, the default is to feel that there must be a reason for it. And that this is about half true. The reason is you're based on your internal chemistry. Again, this is only about half true. Your internal chemistry is the way it is because of some stimuli or some reason. Uh, you need a theory of mind, a, a way to end the, to apply that theory of mind to yourself in order to fully understand the way that this works. Uh, otherwise, you're attributing your mental state to the rest of the universe and the state of the rest of the universe in a way that is not necessarily valid. Again, this is very related to previous videos. You can see the argument from ignorance kind of sticking out there. Unfortunately, this kind of reasoning leads to abuse, literally physical abuse. You, the, the argument will eventually get to, quote, maybe I really did deserve to be called names. Maybe I really did deserve to get hit. If you're in a relationship and you're getting called names and physically hit, that's a problem, and you should actually go and seek help. And yet, this uh, the, uh, the, the reasoning from emotion is exactly how you get into that situation. So again, it's, it's something to keep in mind, watch out for. The United Nations uses appeals to emotions when they, they try to get you to support refugees. This is not to say that we shouldn't help refugees. There's a lot of refugees out there that need help right now. But again, the, the tying to our emotion uh, in the way that they do it uh, is almost entirely based just on emotion itself. Of course, the problem is, is that if you actually understood the full extent of the problem that refugees face worldwide, because there's so many of them, I, you would probably be paralyzed by fear and, and you know, absolutely depressed because the problem is so bad. Uh, so they're, 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 it's, it's kind of a, a, a problem of what exactly do we do about this situation. Should we do exactly what the UN says? You know, if, if, if they can make a case for it, sure, but they should. And we should accept only if there is a case being made for it. Uh, So-called so sob stories are another example of an appeal to emotion, which cops and security guards have to deal with a lot in their day-to-day -day life. Where People will try to raise, uh, raise an exception or, or try to make themselves look exceptional uh, due to their context or due to the particular unfortunate chain of events that have led them to breaking some rule or some law or to being in the wrong place at the wrong time. This raises a good question of what exactly should a reasonable person do? At what point or what context is a reasonable person supposed to take into account when enforcing laws or enforcing rules? or when acting in general? These are good questions and should be thought about, but one thing to keep in mind is that our emotional states aren't the only thing that's important when we're actually thinking about that. Appeals to hope, yet another reason, or another way that our emotions can be used against us. Uh, the past president of the United States, almost entire his entire campaign was based entirely on hope uh, and trying to get people to feel hopeful. Experiments have shown that hope appeals uh, when people are experiencing fear and ne other negative emotions. So again, if, if you're uh, being driven to some end or to some conclusion because your emotional state is, you know, st by default fear, um, you know, you really have to be careful what direction you're being pulled. 
otherwise you're going to be pulled astray and not based on anything, again, for, for any reasonable or, or justifiable reason. Uh, the, the, the kind of last thing worth pointing out here is that you can appeal to empathy and you can, you, there, are, there are things in your brain called mirror neurons which basically create emotions when you see someone else experiencing those emotions. And so if you're creating empathy for someone who's suffering, you're, you're, you're kind of simulating or creating the, the, the uh, something like that suffering in your own mind. Th this kind of brings up the question of what should we be using our emotions for if not to, to, to make empathy work and to make our mirror neurons effective? Um, are, they good, are our emotions good for anything at all if they can be abused in these many, many different ways? Even without getting into the best way to use our emotions, which is, it, is really a topic for another video, it's worth considering that there's a good argument to be made that our emotions are part of what makes us human. And so if we completely turn off all our emotions, and we turn away from all of our emotional states, we're really becoming more like sociopaths. And that isn't necessarily a good outcome either. There's a psychologist by the name of R.D. Lang, who's he's, he's worth looking up for a couple of reasons. Uh, but one of the points that he kind of made in, in one of his books or whatever uh, is that when you're dealing with someone and trying to convince them of something, uh, especially in a therapy situation, but in other situations as well, the person that you're talking with is a sen very similar to you, oh, yeah. and it's, it's worth being humane and compassionate with them and to realize that their emotional state has just as much of a right to be tied to the facts and information as yours does. Mm -hmm. And that, again, their emotional state has just as much of a right to be tied to your emotional state as yours does to theirs. And so that there's, it's worth considering the other person that you're talking to and the, their emotional state as having value in and of itself. Uh, it's not necessarily good to to just believe that they should feel what you want them to feel, and that their emotional state has no, you know, no validity on its own. So, uh, the uh, again, so we've gone through this list of of ways that we can be let misled by our emotion. We 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 hopefully have a better respect of other people uh, and their emotional state uh, as a consequence from it. Um, as, as usual for these videos, if you have any uh, questions or want to make uh, an appeal to the emotional content of either me or any other uh, reader or listener to this video, feel free to post it anywhere where this video is posted. Uh, do we have any uh, questions from the audience today? Nope. No questions? Okay. Well, um, hopefully you enjoy. I will see you next video. See you then.